and Thorsten Schwedes Group here in Basel at the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. And I'd like to talk uh, about the continuous effort we do in benchmarking. So I think uh, over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of improvement in the quality of structures. And of course, that's largely uh, through algorithmic improvements. There um, have been more structures. But also benchmarking has come a long way since CASP started and, and done a great deal in the beginning. Uh, the Im important of getting more data is with continuous uh, efforts like Cameo. And uh, I'd like to first show how Cameo works. So basically, the PDB has a weekly release cycle. The release is on Wednesday. And the pre-release of sequences that you know what's going to come out on Wednesday, that's on Saturday morning. So we're going to harvest that sequence uh, um, information along with some ligand information. Um, and then we do a target selection step. The next step would be a submission. So all the participants, which are usually um, uh, servers uh, that are alive um, or in the development, then get sequences submitted. And they have four days to return the uh, predictions. After these uh, four days, the PDB releases the targets. And that means we have reference structures. And then we basically start by validating these structures. And then a subsequent a scoring step that gives us the evolution that we then publish uh, on our website. This has now uh, been online for seven years, uh, which I'm very happy about. And it also has been recently improved very much in terms of code base and also the robustness of the workflow. We've ported it to Nextflow. So what's special about Cameo? Cameo is continuous, as I just said. It runs every week. That means you get a lot of targets and fast feedback on your method development. So on average, we get about 20 targets at the moment. It's fully automated, so nobody is intervening. It's so producible. And also, it's open, so if you have suggestions, what you would like to have uh, as, uh, assessed, or if you have a new score that you'd like to have tried, this is um, just step up and, and, and mention it, and we're happy to look into it. The metrics, of course, there is not a single score that fits all the modeling aspects. And that's why we have a lot of scores that you can sort with. And then we, we try to uh, mm, honor that uh, different aspects that are important. And it goes from single chain scores up to oligomer scores. The audience at the moment is mostly method developers and, of course, those people who review us. Um, uh, but also, we would like to make some more effort towards the users of these methods, which are in the life science. CASP uh, was already mentioned several times, uh, thanks to John Mould, and it was established very early on. Uh, so I'd like to show some related complementary efforts to Cameo. So while Cameo is continuous, and we've seen a lot of targets uh, in, in the, the last seven years, it has around 1,000 uh, targets per year. It's fully automated, and CASP has a human expert assessment and has about 100 structures every two years. And the important bit about CASP is this meeting that actually allows people to interact and, and improve and find new bottlenecks they can overcome. There are more um, uh, efforts in this area, which I don't have time to talk much about. It's Capri for protein-protein interaction. It's T3R with uh, kelp, which is very similar to Cameo. It's also a rolling effort that looks at ligand post predictions. And there's also uh, um, a recent effort in the, along the dis intrinsic disorder um, that I tried to go also for continuous. And they have an, uh, their own session on Thursday. So if you look at performance, there are many ways to look at performance. We have a default one that basically shows you um, the percentage of targets that you have uh, uh, returned. And then you have a, a score at the moment that's LTDT, which basically reports the fraction of preserved distances um, of your model in, in concerning the targets um, across four thresholds, similar to GDDHA, if you're familiar with that. Um, and then you can see many of the servers do return quite a lot of targets for the time range, which is the last three months. But if you want to compare a bit in more detail, this is not enough. And that's why we offer that you can do common subset comparison. That means you can select a few servers, and then you have an identical target set. And that's much more um, um, telling if you go into details. The trouble is, if you have uh, mixed uh, server performances in there, usually the um, hard targets tend to drop out because only the best methods can predict that. And that's why we offer also a binary comparison. And the binary comparison actually allows to do the head-to-head -head comparison between many. So you have your reference server. That could be your server. could be any other server. And then you compare it to the rest. And in this way, you don't have the problem of the hard targets dropping out. Of course, we also have a detail page. And there's lots of scores on there going from single-chain score, from binding side score, uh, to uh, oligo scores. 
important for us, and we realized it very early on, is that people can start anonymously. So you're not being publicly exposed to, when you, um, to, the, to the audience when you're just starting fresh. That's very important. That helps people to just try things over a few weeks, and when they're happy, they start um, the, um, the switch server to public, and everybody can see the results. Comparing uh, is uh, important, and that's why you have seen a long time the naive blast. Uh, baseline, basically, this runs the blast against the PDB to find the template and feed the first template into Modman. Its performance is, is roughly here. You can see it's been outperformed by many others. Um, and why it's over here, that's another subject I come to in a minute. But what we like to go now for is basically to have an upper baseline. Something like that re would reflect the best single template that you could find, would you have known the structure. Now the difference to that, uh, to Naive Blast, is that this method can only run on Wednesday because it needs a reference structure. So this is an artificial baseline that you couldn't reach because you don't know the baseline and you don't know the target structure. And that works with the MLine at the moment that we scan the PDB for a template and we build models with the uh, Promo3 engine and uh, of the first templates uh, that we find by TM score. And then out of these, we select the best model, and this is returned, and we estimate based on a three-month data set that we had that the performance is roughly here. So with this, we, we're trying to get both aspects, upper and lower baseline, in, into Cameo. Talking all the time about targets is, of course, important to note. Um, of the 20 targets we submit, they're of different uh, difficulty and also of different aspects. So generally, we have about 480 targets in half a year. 190 roughly uh, allow a homo, homo oligomer assessment of these, and there are also targets with ligands in there, which are around 165. Then, if you think about difficulty, you, you, the moment we do that at, uh, in, at, at Cameo is basically you look at what has been returned in terms of models, and you average that, and that's a post -diff diction difficulty that we get. So it will be around 100 for the easy. Um, um, a bit more than uh, uh, two and a half times double for medium and 135 for hard. The, the, the fact uh, basically that these are based on a single chain uh, means that the difficulty isn't necessarily reflected for the other two aspects that you're modeling. And this is something we're looking into right now. The difficulty as such at the moment is defined as a, uh, by an LTD threshold. Um, you could of course think of also, also as something like a prediction difficulty that you finding no templates for HH splits, uh, uh, template search would also indicate a hard target, for example. Now, the, once we have targets and we validate them, at the moment, this is a very rough validation. We only exclude targets, the, uh, include targets that are from X-ray or from NMR. And uh, of course, we could start arguing what, whether this should be in or not. It has uh, important bits missing. Uh, and you can clearly see uh, that there is not a lot of contact between the two fragments. So I would argue this shouldn't be in. Um, but because we don't want to do that on an argument base, we want to do that fully automated, the idea is that we look into uh, the PDB validation pipeline because all the reference structures that we tap into, they actually come attached with a full validation report uh, that's available programmatically for us as well. Um, they run separate pipelines for X-ray, NMR, and EM. And what we like to do at the moment, we focus on X-ray uh, and looking at general things like the agreement between model and diffraction data. Uh, the geometric validation, and, and some sort of small molecule validations, which I'd like to uh, describe in a bit more detail now. So you've probably seen all these uh, uh, bars that the PDB offers. So that's a rough um, um, f a set of five criteria that they put up first, which we, we're going to also pick up in our um, evaluations. And um, Again, I have to stress this can only be done on Wednesday, so the, uh, a slight problem occurs, of course, because I have to submit the sequences nevertheless on Saturday, since I do not know the structure either. Um, so we will have targets that will be invalidated uh, based on these uh, assignments. And how can we do that? Basically, um, if you look at the entire uh, structure, you will be excluding low-quality structures of general problems. The second focus we'd like to give is, is ligands, because we would like to, to also include a ligand modeling aspect in the future, so include ligands as uh, uh, ligand poses in the assessment. And there we need to be sure that we are actually getting relevant ligands, ligands that are, make sense to be used as references. And the, the last aspect is the binding side around it, and that would be a bit similar to, to the low-quality structures, but more as on the localized uh, area around the ligand. So I'd like to talk about the first two now. Um, basically, many um, 
uh, structures would be excluded based on the R3 that it would be too high. Uh, and R3 is a measurement for how well the model fits to the data that wasn't used to, to train the model. Um, and so everything here would be good and everything past that bar would be excluded by our current measure. Then we look at the R value because it's important that it doesn't change after refinement too much, but otherwise that indicates a bad model as well. We look at the Chandran outliers that should be uh, below 2%, that uh, includes all the side chain and uh, the backbone um, um, confirmation. We look at parasitue uh, outliers that shouldn't be too high, and of course, uh, some general problems. And if you think about uh, this first set of measures, which there are a few more that I didn't mention now, it would be roughly 90 structures. So out of the f almost four 500, it would be roughly 400 targets that remain. So we don't know exactly if that's gonna be this, the, the, the case, but this is our estimate based on the data we have at the moment. If you look at ligands, um, then you would probably agree that if you very high up in this uh, cross-correlation uh, measure that we are looking into, the, the ligand actually matches very well uh, the density. This is still okay if you go to the 0.9, which is our intended threshold, uh, where you can see that some of the ligand uh, now st starts to be not perfectly modeled in the, in the density. And then uh, if you go even, even lower down, you can clearly see the difference in the map in the density shows unused density and this is not model either, and then this is science fiction. So uh, I think this is a, a bar that we can start up with. The PDB actually remains point, recommends 0 0.8, so I think we are on a, on a conservative side here. So if you think about uh, what I've shown today, I think it's important to note that we get weekly publication-ready data because it's all ob objective, so I don't, uh, Camilla doesn't know any structures at the beginning, so it's real uh, benchmarking data every week. Uh, it's very important to have these anonymous servers to lower people, it's a burden to come in to uh, encourage people to try, and I actually also encourage method developers that do not have yet a server to come because it's, it's really open and, and it, you should benefit from this, uh, this resource. Um, we've seen that the upper and lower baselines are, are, are really crucial for people to find out where they can improve, and we intend to, to do that across uh, other categories um, in Cameo. Um, the target validation is at my heart because I think it's important to have a good data set that we can really rely on, and I'm rather on the conservative side. So if you have any comments on, on the measures we should use, at part from what we came up with uh, together with the PDB, we're very open to check that. Uh, and also it's important to note that with the new next slow workflows, the maintenance uh, load on the weekly run has even reduced, so uh, it's, it's, it crashes much less. Not that it crashed a lot, but it's really important that it's resume is very easy. So, of course, we want to uh, uh, look a bit ahead and, and, and the run the best single template method uh, every week to find out the upper baseline uh, performance. Um, the fully automated target validation um, is, is still to come. They'll be prepared at the moment. And this actually uh, comes into a, a new um, category that we are preparing at the moment, which is still hidden. So we have started to include protein assembly assessments. So we're looking at protein complexes. So if you have methods that can predict that, I'm also encouraging you to, to step up and, and register already now, although the results are not there, because we will uh, allow them to be downloaded soon. Then there's another effort, uh, Open eBench, um, that's going to give a talk at BOSC that basically um, generalizes the entire effort a bit, and we help to generate the data model there. We're also looking into how can we um, maybe use the system as a fallback for us to be with yet another aspect of being flexible in the running the, the system. And then there is something I'd also like to point out. We are, we are running the model archive uh, in, in Torsten's group as well, and we um, intend to put regular releases of benchmarks there because Camille is a running target, so you will not get the same data set again uh, by default. Of course, you can request it, so I'm happy to do it, but I think it's important to attach a digital object identifier to it so you can reference in your paper as well. And there's also a poster for that. So thank you uh, for your attention, and I would like to acknowledge the team, the current team, the past teams, uh, and the Schwede Lab, especially for the nice environment, Thorsten for his uh, uh, allowing of, of to pour, trying out things, the Elixir work package too, that's basically all around benchmarking, and of course the participants, because without the participants there wouldn't be any coming. Thank you very much. Questions, sir? Thank you, Ariane. That's a really nice talk, and uh, you know, I've I've, uh, I, I've grown to appreciate Cameo more. I haven't used it recently, but it was uh, certainly very early. Uh, early on, it was very it was very useful for our server development. I've got a comment, I guess, for you, and also I guess the CASP uh, organisers, who are kind of also represented here. 
Um, so one thing I like about Cameo is the fact that it's kind of, it, it's obviously a continuous process. And I think one of the problems that's now occurred, that CASP now suffers from is it's too slow. Uh, the, the rapid development that we see in the technology can't be, you know, the, the quantization of a two year cycle I think is too long, I think, to, to, to allow us to develop the techniques as rapidly as they need to be developed. So Cameo could fill that gap. What, as a predictor, annoys me a little bit about Cameo is that it's not CASP. Is that, is that obviously you've gone your different ways about the metrics and, and various, and I, and I understand that, but it would be rather nice if we could kind of bridge the gap between CASP and, and Cameo in some way or have a kind of meta layer where we can kind of track CASP-like uh, progress using the Cameo kind of infrastructure. I don't know if that's something you probably talk about as, a, as a people I don't know, but as a predictor, that would help me a lot more, I think, than having the two separate things going on at different cycles. Uh, anyway, that's just a... But anyway, it's just your comment on that. Is, it, is, is that possible or something that could well, never it's, happen? It's not that separate in the first place, as you already uh, guessed. Sure. Um, of course, uh, we do not mix the scores, so that's a main difference, I think. And I don't think uh, this is something that's special to come on. It's also very good because you want to sort along with different aspects. And uh, this is uh, in particular because we want to target the users of the models as well, which is much easier to understand. Uh, I can understand that experts uh, like uh, yourself understand the CASP uh, scores still, but if, if you talk to a life scientist, that's beyond grasp because you're mixing different concepts, so it's harder. So that's why we have the different scores. Of course, we, we're looking at uh, a collaboration constantly, and, and also with Cabri, we are looking at, at how we can uh, um, collaborate on target uh, validation or target selection, all aspects of scoring. Yeah, I, I guess one problem is that because it's automatic, there can't be any parsing into predictable units, and so you stick to a local metric, and we, tend, we do have the local metric, we tend to put emphasis on a global metric, so... I guess, I mean, for some targets, a global metric is fine, right? So we could have some arrangement where you would use TM or GDTTT on targets which are suitable. Well, the, the, these values are available. So basically, okay. if you see that it's not a, a several domain protein, you can use them. So they're, they're right there. They're just not in the aggregates at the moment. Uh -huh. So the aggreg aggregates only feature superposition free scores. I guess we should talk about what the best thing to do, David, is. Very nice talk. Um, I think Camille is very useful service for us to continuously test our methods during the development. Um, one question is, as you mentioned, that um, there are about 20 targets per week. Sometimes that's quite a lot for the many predictors. Uh, they don't have a lot of their computing uh, power. And also the field now actually is focused more on their hard, hard case modeling, basically, every initial modeling. So I think that's very uh, most exciting part in the protein structure position as demonstrated in the CASP 11, 12, uh, and so on. So I was wondering if you guys can uh, select, when you select targets, focus more on the harder targets if needed, if you can reduce the size of the targets to smaller number, but focus more on that ones that you couldn't find very good uh, templates using IGG search and other uh, tools. Yeah, so I, I, I hinted at that a bit during the talk. I didn't have time too much to talk about, but in the end, but the moment we strongly did not interfere in target selection. So basically, we just kick out stuff that's really too easy, way too easy. Yeah. And you've seen the naive plants being quite high up in performance. That indicates it's still not too hard to, to get to these. So uh, we are discussing how we are, we're looking at this, but in, in, on average, you should have a spread, of course, with all difficulties represented. So I'm not going to go only for hard targets. Uh, for sure, so it will be always a mix, and we can always discuss. In the new category, you actually have the option to opt in to get everything, because I think speed is very important too. So you can see that there's a, a really wide range of, of requirements of people requesting more targets on the one hand and other targets, and harder targets and fewer targets. So it's, it's something we actively discuss at the moment. Yeah, yeah I mean, f first a comment, to maybe more to Cas, but I think we should abandon domain uh, divided division I mean, predictions because it's basically I mean nowadays we should be able to predict multi-domain proteins uh, and, and, and secondly I mean that, that would merge Casper Cameron but I have a question for you the next step would be to do hetero complexes I guess mm -hmm. so uh, or uh, in Cameo do you have I mean, the problem would be I guess stoichiometry and things like that do you have that information on Saturday no no but you, but you have the chains 
I only get the unique sequences for the chain, so I do not so know anything about uh, um, the stoichiometry. Okay, but you, but, you, but you know if you have uh, multiple chains in the same PDB. Yeah. Sure, that's yeah. the only indica yeah. indication yeah. that it will be so a okay, so you, you people would have to predict stoichiometry also in that case. Yes, yeah. okay. so the, this beta, uh, uh, this new category that I described, yeah. you will have to, to infer what, what is the actual situation, monomer, homo, oligomer, or heteromer. It will be all in there, reflecting the real case, because yeah. that's actually what life scientists want. Okay, thank you, Jürgen. Thank you very much. So, so now we're going to have a couple of talks. Go ahead and set up. Uh, a couple of talks on.